Welcome to the NLP View with your host, Donna Blinston. Each week, Donna will explore how the techniques of NLP can help improve your personal and professional life. And now, here's your host, Donna Blinston. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NLP View. My name is Donna Blinston. On today's show, I am joined by Paul Andrew, a fitness trainer, nutrition consultant, NLP certified trainer and master practitioner, clinical hypnotherapist, and soon to be a psychotherapist. Neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, is an applied psychology that enables individuals to address the deeper underlying issues that may be holding them back on their quest to improve their health and fitness. An individual's perception of themselves and beliefs they hold around their health and fitness can often be the direct course of their current health state It is possible for everyone to optimize their health and fitness, but often the individual struggles to lose weight, get fit and achieve their true potential because their underlying limiting beliefs causes a lacking commitment and motivation. On today's show, Paul will discuss how he is very successfully using NLP as a fitness trainer, using his Navy training and background psychology to ensure your mind and body get into shape. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Paul Andrew. Hello, Paul. Hello, Donna. How are you? I'm extremely well. How are you? Really good. Really good. I am. i am uh, got just been on some wonderful courses um, which have extended my abilities and the way I think about things even further, which is always great. Um, where I'm going to take them is a completely different thing, but I know I'm feeling fantastic at the moment. I'm sure they'll find their own uh, their own niche. They will, certainly. Well, I guess I want to start, really, with thanking you for joining me today on the show. I'm really excited about our interview. We have previously discussed with other guests how you can use NLP to win at sports, tools for coaches, tools for weight loss, and um, ways to look at your health and your fitness in different ways, but nothing particularly on um, what you do and actually using it within fitness as you do fitness boot camps and things like that. So I think um, it'd be very, very beneficial for our our audience. So I guess I'll start off with saying thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Before we go any further, Paul, can you tell our audience about yourself? Yeah, um, uh, I've been in the Navy 20 years. Uh, The past 10 of those as a Navy physical trainer, um, which is very much command response, what we do with the recruits. So. When I came to my enlightening years, shall I call it, when I discovered NLP, um, I discovered that there's much, much better ways of working with people. So to broaden my skill set, I I went out to work with uh, civilians and particularly those that weren't that into physical fitness or were really stuck in places with their eating. So we started a a boot camp, we, we called it, for want of a better word, where we could really get people together in a community, use some coaching and NLP skills and move them on. Wow. I take my hat off to you. I do. It must have been um, quite interesting to to look at it from where you've been within the Navy world, um, where I'm, well, uh, naively, I'm presuming that it's very much um, quite regimented as far as the the fitness. It's... um, in my world, I see it as quite an expected part of that in comparison to civilians who are, um, in effect, coming to do fitness from a different angle. Is that is that true or is that just uh, the way I've got it in my head? Uh, in initial training, yeah, we are quite strict with them, but that's to move them from civilians into, into servicemen. But after that, we've got great sports people and we use a lot more coaching skills. So we get to develop that side. But a little bit like the NHS, we've spoke before, where um, the forces can be stuck in their way of thinking. So moving on to NLP and coaching is definitely becoming more part of it, which is great to see. It is. It's very exciting. Very exciting times. So tell me more about your enlightening years then. So where where did it start with NLP? What 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 made um, NLP, I guess, the, the choice in comparison to other areas? Oh, I actually went on a, a leadership course, Donna, which was um, uh, all quite half military, half civilian. And there was one afternoon on NLP, so the, the course was a week long, and I didn't connect that much with the material. And then the one afternoon, 
is the whole thing about cause and effect on NLP and the communication model. And it blew my mind, to be honest. Um, yeah. When I realised oh, yeah. that I didn't have to believe every thought in my head and I did have a choice, it was uh, pretty life changing. I think the cause and effect is that, well, on my training, um, we were basically invited to do, um, to play a game for two weeks where we're at cause rather than being at, at effect. So for our audience, you're very much, you can either be at cause in your life where you take responsibility for your actions, you, um, yeah, you take responsibility. You're no longer the, the cause or using problems that are around in your life to be excuses or justifications, which is when you're at effect. So when you're at effect, you're very much the result of other people's behavior. And it's not a case that I'm saying that being at effect is completely wrong. It's not a resourceful place, and it certainly doesn't give you ways of looking at things differently or an easy way to get out of the emotions that you're in. So being at effect, you are, you're no longer in charge. You are the result of somebody else's behavior. You are reacting because of what somebody else has done. So the, um, the course that I went on, the wonderful Jeremy Lazarus, asked us all to play a game for two weeks and be at cause. So for everything that happened, whether that be that I went into work and we were short staffed or um, whatever event we went on where I would normally have got into that moan fest of another shift, it's going to be really, really hard with two and three staff down and moan, 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 moan. I was like, okay, I'm at cause. The fact is we are short staffed. I can't do anything about that. That's not going to change. How am I going to manage my current situation? So that was my mind change. And I've not stopped playing that game. And I'm now eight years down the line and I won't ever go back to not playing it. So it, I completely get where you say of how it um, blew your mind. Because it certainly blew mine. It transformed how I work. It transformed me from being a newly qualified nurse into a leader and move me into different places. So I completely respect that, Paul. Yeah, it's a great game, the cause game, Donna. Uh, and I like to play it with some of my clients. Uh, a lot of them are challenged with, with their eating, have you, young children or, or male you know, partners that are highly active that need more calories. So I get them to set up something called the cause cupboard in their kitchen. Wow. Um, where, you know... Oh, we, we have to buy biscuits because we've got young children, which is absolutely, you know, it, it's spot on. But do they need to eat them? So if they set themselves up a cause cupboard with all the healthy foods that they really enjoy, then they've got another choice. That's a fantastic idea, Paul. That'll be one that I'll be doing this afternoon. <laughs> I know you've got a, a young child, Donna. Oh, I have. And, you know, they have a beautiful range of chocolates and crisps and sweeties that are out there. Um, which I do choose not to eat, um, but a cupboard would make that even easier, which is fantastic. How else do you use them, the cause and effect? Uh, well, actually, when we do the boot camps, we've got a particular room. So um, I like to put up the big cause and effect poster. I'm very tongue in cheek when I hear any excuses or justifications. Um, obviously, with a great deal of empathy, then we I just remind them whether they're being at cause or at effect. Hmm. So, yeah, yes. yeah, I get them to say, you know, so how would you like to be instead? What, what, in an ideal world, what would you like it to be? And they'll give me um, their ideal setting and then obviously some of that they can do. So, yeah, moving them into choice and an outcome. Transform everything for them, won't it? It does, yeah. It always, because we all get stuck and uh, sometimes just thinking, well, what can I do? This situation is as it is. What little bit or huge part of it can I change? And then you're back into movement and that makes a, a big difference. And it is that movement, isn't it? Because even I think one thing I find with a lot of clients is that I teach cause and effect on the first day or well, the first 10 minutes is the first thing I go through um, with every client. But we look at the cause and effect. And for some people, they do need to be in effect for a time which is fine, you know, if there's something sad or emotional has happened, then, you know, be at your effect. But at what point are you going to stop? How long are you going to allow it to affect you in that way? And it's that that's the change. 
and one thing that every single one of them says, and even if it's something that they haven't got, it's completely out of their control, that little bit of movement that they get when they've got choices seems it snowballs, doesn't it? They've got more and more and more ways that they can do it different. And it's just that thing of how, how long are you going to allow it to affect you? And having that question thrown at you sometimes can be a bit of a slap in the face. Absolutely. Um, and, I mean, you can encourage them to be at cause about being at effect. So yes. in the fitness world, if someone's going away and they're going on holiday and, you know, I have to eat all these bad foods, it's my one week of the year. <laughs> You can block that out and say, yeah, all that is true, but you can be at cause and when are you going to get back on the horse? Yeah, I did that this weekend, actually. Um, I didn't have to eat um, that wonderful bucket of um, a chicken product um, that I bought. Um, I'm sure there was plenty of other options. And even when I was stood there ordering it, I could see a salad option. <laughs> and I decided, no, I've been away. I've been training, going to treat myself. And this morning, I'm back to my muesli and semi-skimmed milk. <laughs> Skimmed milk, should I say. So, yeah, you can. It's allowing yourself. And I think some people get worried that if they're at cause all the time, they can't have the um, the other things that are available. And that's one thing I hear quite a lot is that the client will say, well, if I'm at cause all the time, I've got to take responsibility and life will be boring, which is as far from the possible truth as it possibly could be. However, it is something that keeps getting thrown back at me. Is that something that you ever experience? Uh, I think with regards to food, um, absolutely, you've got to have treats and be at cause about when you choose to eat them. The minute that food starts to run your life, then... Uh, yeah, you, you're not at cause anymore. It's all about, there are no bad foods. It's just your association to them. Yeah. So being at cause and saying, you know, maybe having a cheap day or the odd piece of cake is actually how you eat well long term. Mm. So when you say you can't have them, the big willpower beast will win in the end. Because willpower <laughs> is actually like a muscle and it will tire out. So you've yeah. had a particularly task, uh, taxing day customers getting on your nerves or you know all those effect kind of stuff can drag your willpower down so if you're going to try and throw your eating plan into the mix then it will get you so yeah having yeah i've got a couple of biscuits i've not had a great day i can have those truly be with them be present with them enjoy them and then get back to your muesli and semi skim milk so yeah absolutely <laughs> How how do you use it with um, the fitness, particularly the, fit, the, the fitness side? Uh, cause and effect. Hmm. Well, I just get people, I, I often say the hardest thing about training is uh, sometimes putting your trainers on. So if you have had a yeah. tough day, then just do it. Get to cause, do the first smallest step that will get you there. Because if you're in a group that really motivates you with a trainer that really motivates you, 99% of the time, people say, I feel fantastic after it. They just yeah. get to cause and do the first smallest thing. So, okay, I'll put my trainers on. Now I'll just get to the car. And then before you know it, you're with the group that really motivate you. You're in a fantastic state and you've loved it. So just do the first smallest thing. And that links really into our communication model, where you, if you change your physiology, you automatically change your state. I know certainly the getting to the gym bit is, um, in my, for me, was the hardest bit. However, when I was there, it was fantastic. And when I came out, even though I had about a 1,004 excuses coming home from work as to why I shouldn't go to the gym, um, getting home, one being that it was a very, very long day or very, very busy, coming home to go and then go back out to go to the gym was um, probably as far from my want as I could have possibly imagined. However, I did it mainly because I paid for it, so that was my motivation ticket. Got to the gym and then afterwards felt healthier, fitter and with more energy than I felt before going to the gym. And being able to do that, what I did for the rest of the evening got me even more results, whereas reality would have been I'd have come home from work, done tea and slumped in front of the telly probably for the rest of the evening. Whereas I came home, managed to clean the whole house. I started a project, read a couple of chapters and did work on my essay, which wouldn't have happened. So it's that, when I say the communication model, 
because we see things differently, we feel healthier, we're more um, infused and motivated, our perception of what's happening at home is different. So we take in things differently, which creates a different internal representation. That in itself is that movement then between our physiology and our state. So the fact that my physiology was better, my state was better, I was happier, I was more upbeat, I was more uh, energized, my outward behavior was better, which meant my results was better, which is the whole circle of the NLP communication model, compared with the going to be at effect and slump in the corner and watch telly, which for some nights would have been, would have been nice, but that going to the gym bit and that, as you say, getting the trainers on and going there makes all the difference. Absolutely. I mean, in NLP, we've got a thing called state-dependent recall as well. So when you've been to the mm. gym and your endorphins are flowing and you're highly motivated, you're going to carry that back home. So you're going to remember all the other times when you were totally motivated and up for it and think, go on, bring it on. I'm going to clean the house. I'm going to do that essay. Bring it on. So, yeah, you're going to remember all the other times when you were motivated and that can translate across context. So by incorporating exercise and good eating, then, yeah, you probably will have more energy at work. Um, although you took out a little bit of time to train, you'll find yourself blitzing through all the other stuff you need to do. You do. You do, definitely. And it's a knock-on effect, isn't it? Because it helps them with the home and your partner. Because if you are particularly um, tired, certainly when I've had harder days at work and I come home drained and exhausted, a bit tired, possibly a bit irritable or short-tempered, um, which I'm sure well everyone does, don't they, really? I'm saying that generalising, but I can imagine a lot of people do. That must have a knock-on effect to their partner and their home environment. So it's the whole vicious circle, isn't it, that um, is transformed. It is, yeah, and that's one thing in the, in the company I work for, and certainly for my own values, is considering the ecology. So those people at home, we, we call the ecology, so the effect your changes have around you. So when someone's changing their fitness and their eating, uh, we definitely encourage how is this going to have an impact on those that you leave behind or those at home. So if, if someone's going on a certain healthy eating plan, and their husband and their children might not be on it. So questions about, you know, how are you going to manage that? And you're all going to still sit down together. And the time you're going to miss out while you're going training, uh, how are you going to fit in that quality time with your family? And that's all about the lifestyle change. So when you look at the ecology and build that a support structure around you, that's when it moves on and becomes a part of yours and your family's life. That's excellent because it's so important. I don't think um, we give it enough respect, the ecology, and we don't look at the consequences of our behaviour enough. And even though um, just saying the words, going, I'm going to go to the gym, automatically has loads of positives for you. But unless you look at the, um, the possible negatives that it could cause, like the loss of um, family time, especially if that time's limited, those are the things that will move us away from doing it because they're going with our, going against our other values as far as our family life, our children. So it's that whole whether we're moving towards or we're moving away from our values. So even though fitness and family time are, might be next to each other or one above the other, even though they might be very high on our values list and something that we want to do, if one is compromising the other, we'll be going against ourselves. So the fact that you identify that and go through that is oh, it's inspiring, it really is. Do you look any further into values with um, absolutely, your Donna. clients? Absolutely, Yeah, absolutely. And it's something I've just done with a, a couple of clients now that are going to join. It's one of the first things we do. So before we even talk about goal setting and um, you know where they want to go with their fitness, we have a look at their values. So what's important? Because some people don't like to be overly encouraged. I mean, the, the blanket setting for a, a generalized fitness instructor is get into everyone's face in a good way uh, and encourage them. But some people just like to like to sit back a little bit and they don't like to yeah. be competitive. So by getting their values, you often get, I like to feel safe in a class and protective and a bit of community. So knowing where those people are, you know, that's their that's their strategy. That's how they get motivated and get the most out of their session. 
So when you mm. know that as a trainer, you can know that they are putting a hundred percent in and that's their way of doing it. So we do a lot on values. Yeah. Before we even think about what they're going to be eating, how they're going to be training, we talk about, um, start with the end product in mind. So make sure they're in the best state they can be. And by connecting with their values is the way we're going to do that. Yeah. And that'll help you as a fitness instructor to understand what their what their meaning is behind their values. Because we might we might both have respect as being a value, but our perception of how we know when we're being respective might be two poles apart. So where you both think that respect is important, so you might be respecting me by doing your version of respect, if that doesn't meet with my criteria of what my respect means, I'm going to not feel that respect from you. So as a, as a trainer, knowing their values and why their criteria around achieving their values must arm you with thousands of resources and ways to support that person even more effectively. It does, yeah, absolutely. And by getting them together as a group to map them out and seeing, oh, yeah, you know, people do do work life differently. It's great for them. Yeah. But it must, it, well, it's got to knock on to every other aspect of their life because fitness does, well, health and fitness is the, is the be-all and end-all with a lot of different things. If that isn't there as a foundation, there'll be a lot of other things that potentially could be quite rocky. Yeah. Like the commitment at work yeah. or the, their financial success or their home environment relationship success. So it is, it's a pillar that you're building really for them, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So when you're fitness and you're, and you're eating, it's all connected with your positive self-image. So again, going yeah. back to the communication model with a positive self-image, people tend to stand up and move a little bit more confidently. So those that work around them take that on at a conscious and unconscious level. And then it reverberates out. So as a manager looking, oh, who should I promote? Someone that's looking after themselves, got a, a state of groundedness and inner confidence. They tend to shine out. Yeah, they do. They definitely, definitely. So you've done your cause and effect and you've got into their world and effect from that aspect. And you've understood them as a person and their identity from the values perspective. Did you say the next thing you'd go on to them would be goal setting yeah. for, for them? Yeah. Getting, Where would you start with that? Getting some good goals. Um, it always surprises me how few people know how to set goals. It's, so, it's mad, isn't it? You literally tend to start with the, <laughs> the SMART model. And then the beauty mm -hmm. of NLP, getting that positive internal representation. So yes. a lot of a lot of clients I have that have yo-yo dieted in the past and then gone back to unuseful behaviours, some really struggle or have never tried to get a positive internal representation of how they want to be. Mm. So by not by doing that elegantly through the NLP um well formed outcomes gets them to go there. And then suddenly yeah. they've got a shift and then they're out buying the, the little black dress that they want to move into, which is something they may have previously been uncomfortable with. Mm. Setting a good, smart, achievable goal and getting them to connect with a positive internal representation has is, is caused huge shifts for them. Yeah, it's very, very powerful. Very powerful, especially when you go into that image and they try it on for size. It's um, motivation like I've, oh, well, I've personally never felt before. It's a whole new level of, um, it is a whole new level of motivation, basically, isn't it? Yeah, and connecting with that. And when you've done it once, you can bring that up again as a, vi a visual representation or a feeling or both. And those positive internal dialogue, something you can step into first thing in the morning. So when you're mm. thinking, oh, shall I have a fried egg sandwich or my muesli with skim milk? connect with that positive internal representation of the new ideal you is you know more than likely going to help your decision for the, to be the correct one at that time yep yeah, uh, eating the muesli <laughs> with my skimmed milk <laughs> so once do you revisit that goal as time goes on or um what's there's a lot of importance before i go down that line around having that goal beyond the goal 
So you've got your, your little black dress. Where, where do you go next with them when, once they've achieved that goal and they are in that little black dress? Does, does your work with them carry on? What, what happens then? Yeah, huge learning for me, and it was pretty recently actually, is beyond the goal, it's good to have a vision. So I get them to map out their vision. So their goal could be to be in my little black dress by Christmas 2014, feeling fantastic. But then, as you say, it's kind of, and then what? So the vision yeah. beyond that would be is maybe to be a example to others, a great example to my children and feel fit and healthy. So when you've reached your quantifiable goal, your unconscious mind has still got something, the vision to enjoy and step forward into. So I now put yeah. equal, if not more importance, onto the vision. So all the other stuff encompasses your values. So your measurable goal and step that forward into your vision, which you know you're probably going to keep with you for the rest of your life and there's other things that can contribute to that so definitely set an achievable goal but have an overall vision because you could get if you've got a, a goal of running a marathon and you get injured that could be a, a massive downturn for you but if you've still mm. got a vision of getting fit and being a positive influence on others and a role model for your children you've still come a heck of a lot way towards that and there's other ways to achieve your vision. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't. <laughs> so can you tell our audience how they'd be able to get in contact with you and about your boot camps and, um, and well, yeah, how to get in contact with you, really, your website details? Yeah, our boot camps, uh, the company's SOS Fitness, and we're available at www.sosfitness.com. We're currently up in Scotland. We've got one in Whitley Bay. And we're um, sweeping down through the country, hopefully. Part of my work is, is training the trainers as NLP practitioners and coaches. So bringing it all together. And yeah. hopefully we're going to spread out and, and share the message. Fantastic. Fantastic. And is there any top tips you want to give to our audience before um, we wrap up the interview, Paul? Yeah, my number one top tip is start with the state. So have a quick... Uh, little inventory of your body in the morning and your mind and what how you are so if you imagine yourself as a photocopier start at one end sweep down your body align your thoughts get truly motivated do that first thing in the morning and it will carry on and help you make useful decisions to support your goals throughout the day great tip i like that i do like that i love the photocopying idea <laughs> yeah. <Cool. laughs> Any others? Uh, and just enjoy it. Just really enjoy your journey and treat it as a journey. I think there's, there is a, there's a true gem there in the enjoying the journey and getting rid of that um, that perception that the the gym and the fitness and the exercise and the change in diet is a hard slog. It is that lifestyle as we've alluded to before. It is, yeah. And if you are entertaining thoughts like that, then just do the first smallest thing. Put on your trainers, get in the car, connect with the community that you love, find a trainer you really connect with, and the rest will look after itself. It certainly will. Well, Paul, thank you ever so much for joining me today. And we've shared some fantastic tips and um, insight, really, into how you work and, and how it should, in my perception, how it should be done. I'm sure there's a lot of excellent fitness trainers out there, but I certainly feel that what you do using the NLP tint on it and looking at the cause and effect and getting into the, the individual's world is definitely going to make for a more ecological and a more permanent um, change for people. It's, um, it's definitely, as you say, going into their vision and getting into the, um, their future, which at the end of the day, the, the mission on health and fitness is to do that. So a big thank you from me. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And a big thank you to all of our audience for tuning in today. If you'd like to learn more about NLP, then tune in each week and also visit my website, www.donnablinston.com, where you'll be able to pick up a copy of my best-selling book, Psychobabble, a straightforward plain English guide to the benefits of NLP. Also visit theorganicview.com and sign up for our newsletter, which will keep you updated with the up-and-coming shows, guests and online workshops. 
You'll also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus and LinkedIn where we'll share the YouTube videos that we'll create from the shows that we have previously done and also how to find out what's happening next. Look forward to speaking with you all next week and once again, Paul, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.